So I will uh, essentially uh, cover three very much interrelated issues, uh, the needs and challenges, the opportunities, and the type of action that we need to take in order to address these challenges and make use of the opportunities in front of us. The challenges are enormous, and I will just highlight a few of them. First, the sustainability problems themselves. If you recall back in the year 2002, the World Summit on Sustainable Development identified water, energy, health, agriculture, and biodiversity as key challenges for sustainability, the so-called WHAP areas. But if we are to define this again, I am sure that we will put climate change at the top. At that time, the IPCC report, this last report, was not available, obviously. But if we are to do it again, to do this exercise, exercise again, I'm sure that climate change will be extremely important and critical because it impacts negatively on each of these five critical sustainability areas. These problems, as you all know, are interrelated, they are complex, they are increasingly global, and they are mostly severe and challenging in Africa. And let us just focus a little bit on what Africa uh, faces uh, in terms of these challenges. Some of you might not know the size of Africa. It's a huge continent. You can actually fit into Africa, the US, Australia, Europe, Brazil, and Japan. So the size of the continent is larger than all these countries combined. And yet, this massive land, 20% of the land surface on Earth, faces enormous difficulties and challenges. 35 of the world's 50 least developed countries are in Africa. 70% of all Africans live on less than $2 a day. Over 26 million Africans are infected with HIV AIDS and 2.5 million die each year of AIDS. 73% of Africans do not have electricity, and nearly 1 million Africans are killed by malaria each year. And 42% of Africans have no access to safe drinking water. Now, these are the Millennium Development Goals that yesterday uh, Stephen Lewis uh, very eloquently highlighted in his beautiful talk. Uh, and this, in fact, this uh, Development goals are set because they can give specific targets to address these sustainability problems. But the challenge is this, and this is a report of last year coming from the United Nations. At midway point between their adoption in 2000 and 2015 target date for achieving the MDGs, Sub-Saharan Africa is not on track to achieve any of the goals. And it goes on to say, even the best governed countries on the continent have not been able to make sufficient progress in reducing extreme poverty in its many forms. And there are not that many best governed countries in Africa, as you know. There is a problem that probably many of uh, us do not, are not aware of, and this is the enormous knowledge gap that exists at the moment. Uh, between various regions and various countries in the world. If you look at the production of knowledge, the sheer production of knowledge, uh, in terms of the scientific publications that appear in internationally peer-reviewed journals. And this, by the way, is the latest statistics that we have compiled just last month. It's the first time I'm showing this. It gives the average production of scientific <coughs> papers between the years 2003 to 2007 last year. And you see, of course, the United States contributes most uh, with uh, 20, 27%, followed by Japan and China. And by the way, uh, if I am to do the exercise for the last two years, China will uh, be listed uh, uh, before Japan. Uh, but it goes on until Turkey, which is number 20. And if you look at the developing countries that are included in this table, you will see about six or seven of them out of the 20. But if you look at the total production of knowledge coming out of the South compared to the North, it's only 20%. So 20% of the scientific, current scientific knowledge, cutting-edge knowledge, 
is actually contributed by the South and 80% by the North. But even within the South, we are beginning to see disparities, widening disparities. Uh, here, there is a list of the 15 countries in the South and their contribution to scientific knowledge. China, of course, is number one, followed by South Korea. Uh, but if you look at the tail of the distribution, you will see two countries here, South Africa and Egypt. The disturbing fact is, if you sum South Africa and Egypt, which is about 0.7%, this is almost half of the scientific productivity of the entire African continent, which is about 1.4%. So I'm saying this because I think it's a very disturbing picture. If we want to talk about sustainability and sustainable development and how to tackle real problems facing the world, if we do not address this problem, if we do not build the scientific capacity in the poorest of countries, I don't think that much can be achieved. If we plot the indigenous scientific capacity uh, against the economic strength, you can divide the countries in the world into four groups. Of course, the most important group in this is the OECD countries with a strong science and technology capacity and a strong economy. And in this group is the group of the oil-rich countries, mostly in the Gulf region, where there is very little indigenous scientific capacity, but enormous wealth. And then there are a group of countries here that have s and uh, proficiency, uh, relatively speaking, uh, but uh, not that much of uh, economic strength, but they are trying very hard, in fact, to cross this line. Take, for example, this country, South Korea, which in the 60s, many of the African countries were actually doing better than it in terms of economic strength and also science and technology capacity. But they embraced science and technology as a real challenge. And within a span of 40 years, less than 40 years, they moved all the way and they are now a member of the OECD country. So this shows the power of science and technology. Now, this group of countries here, there are 80 of them. Most of them are in Africa. And this is a group that lacks science and technology, lags behind in science and technology, and also in economic strength. And this is where we really have most of the problems, the so-called s and lagging countries. If you look at how South Korea is performing in science and technology, South Korea produces scientific knowledge 1.6 times that of the entire African continent. This is what the situation now, uh, what situation now in the, in the world. The brain drain is a real issue, as most of you know. It's a serious problem for most developing countries. There is an international market for scientific talent, which is becoming more and more competitive. The USA and uh, the European Union are still the greatest marketplace for talent from the developing countries. And according to UNCTAD, 30 to 40 percent of the developing world scientists live in the north, 30 to 40 percent. And the most recent statistics shows that 60 percent of African postgraduate students in the UK have no intention of returning to Africa, no intention of returning to Africa. 